hear me? Yeah. I think this takes a bit longer than the remaining 10 minutes, but I, th I think not much longer. And uh, actually, I did some slides yesterday in the evening because I learned that some of you are interested on data analytics. And I added something that could help here with this. So the high level or the agenda for this is to have a look at uh, hardware software innovation and some of the things like just-in-time code generations and ISAR extensions. We've seen this in the compiler talk with some motivation why, why there is such a thing like extending the ISAR of an existing processor. And then we look at some of the open source software things. Um, I have to say, I listed the very last line is Intel DAL, MKL, and DNN. Um, there is one exception. It is underneath of the open source uh, caption, but MKL is still not open source as the whole, as a majority, but one part of it at least. Um, let's look at this because um, I said Intel and machine learning because already focuses towards some of the features that come up in the Intel math libraries, but I don't want to, um, you know, tire you with gem or blast level three routines and certain linear solvers you in any case even in these cases you always have to look up the documentation you, you check the feature list and see if there is something that you can use for your case but you have to learn it anyways you have to dig into and see what the details are and how to call it but I, this focuses more on the new side uh, or on new things that you may not know yet and it may help you to make use of it. Um, I think with machine learning, there is a great move, at least on the CPU side, towards just-in-time code generation, because it is certainly a specialized pro problem. You end up with, say, small convolutions and things that require specialized code, because you, you run it over and over again, you can utilize some hard-coded things. And one example here is not a convolution or anything from the machine learning, but rather from image processing. And it is a, essentially a, a 2D stencil uh, depicted on the right-hand side, and you can see it is, uh, certainly it, it promises you that it could be a good idea to go for just-in-time code specialization, since the access pattern or the layout of that stencil, it's like a cross-shaped one, is, is, can be baked into the code. You, you don't have to consider a dense square matrix and then you have some zeros, weights, or things that select the cross. You, you could say, oh, if, if I could just generate a kernel right away, which is hard coding the cross, Sounds like that is a good idea to some extent. You can also hard code grid bounds to some extent, right? You, if, if you push back to some extent, ju just in time code generation is pushing flexibility that you had in your original program towards a, a f fast code generation. So hard coding grid uh, extends doesn't sound a good idea, but in the end, if you, if you are, have fast enough code generation, you have still the same flexibility. Your workload essentially asks for some weird custom grid size that is even user input, but you can generate code on demand and then have a kind of a hybrid. You, you get the benefit of uh, faster execution and hard-coded uh, kernels by, while having still the flexibility of uh, you know, a, a dealing with a real problem or running an algorithm to some extent. So code specialization is definitely an effective uh, optimization and it carries forward to machine learning as well. So if you look at convolutional neural networks in particular, you can see there is a um, good way to exploit memory band with this caches register file similar to what we've seen with the small matrices. And you can essentially, most uh, higher level frameworks today for machine learning are essentially script based. So you, you have some Python framework and then you, you want to have optimal code generated uh, towards the back end. And this is basically the way every of the vendors or implementations go in, in order to get some performance out of it. And it also helps with uh, convolutional neural networks works in particular when you, when you look at a whole topology. If you think about a graph uh, describing a certain uh, topology, you, you can 
ac optimize across graph nodes and generate hard-coded kernels that omit certain memory pushes and reads in between, right? You can fuse essentially kernels together and uh, get more out of the just-in-time code generation. It's basically one example here would be TensorFlow doing things like this. Our hardware specialization, this was the software side, is going a similar path. I already gave you the distinction between what might be a domain-specific ISA and what is a general thing. We talked more in the compiler session about the general uh, instruction set extensions that are able to express a variety uh, or an infinite variety of things that could be helpful to deal with vectors, but you can see domain-specific ISA has a long history, but certainly it has to, to be extended further. You can see for the machine learning side, you have not very new, but you have FMA is for us, for Intel, it's basically a baseline for many others also. You can see many of the open source frameworks just start with AVX2 because it contains FMA instructions and therefore they don't make any effort to go for AVX without FMA. And that sense, this is a very first somewhat domain-specific uh, instruction set extension that makes a, a baseline. And on top of that, we will see this later on, there is something uh, on the Intel hardware side that modifies or extends the, the Knight's Landing that we talked about all the time here during the workshop uh, towards machine learning. And it adds, in fact, just a few more instructions like Quad FMA or the uh, and, and VNNI instruction, NI stands for new instruction all the time. We had that in the past, and quad VNNI, which are essentially for a, 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 variable, um, a variable precision instruction. That, that, is the, that is the idea behind the, NNI, the VNNI uh, instructions here. We will have a look at this uh, later on. There is a big coverage uh, in the open source space, but still a very limited one when you go for machine learning. And there are some things that you can get from Intel. There is a little bit of history in front. I wanted to make the point here. There is the, the Intel software team, the regular one, that also gives the, the commercial software suites. And they also started, at least in the past, with one exception, they, they maintain, very well maintain, Intel TBB, which somewhat is related to the product teams, but it's still open source. And some new thing that is Intel MKL DNN, which also has some counterpart in the open source. So the story there also goes, or it adds things in the open source space, basically, or backs it there. And it's basically a good idea. I don't have to tell you about the advantages of open source. In general, you can see this in the fine print at the bottom of this slide. You avoid vendor lock. You, you, but for the scientists, it's more important to also, when you have a crazy idea and want to implement something, you can just take the existing legacy and you don't have to break with programs that already work. You just are able to add something on top while leveraging the existing things. And your stuff still stays new and added on top so you can, you can just extend existing frameworks. So this whole thing about open source is also the development cycle. It's not just that you pull open source from a vendor and enjoy it, but the whole development cycle and the participation is, uh, is key. And there is some common architecture on the Intel side for the machine and deep learning. You, you still have a classic Xeon, perhaps uh, KNL is somewhat usable towards machine learning. And in particular, you can use the, the Knight's Mill code named uh, Xeon Phi instance that works on, or, or that is optimized towards machine learning. And then the vision here on that slide, which I took from Intel AE days, a series of say worldwide events, uh, is to have something more special which goes or distincts between learning and inference. So you have something that works on the um, training side of uh, machine learning, which is the Xeon processor plus Lakecrest, and then something for the inference part, which is Xeon processor plus FPGA. You can think about that this shares the same socket. You have one socket populated with a regular CPU and then some special device in the other socket and they can talk to each other. It's Knight's Mill instruction set extensions, just going briefly over that. There is something called QFMA, basically a trick. You stay with the same uh, wideness of the machine. You have two instructions per cycle as we learned in the initial uh, session of this workshop, but with uh, the Knight's Mill extensions, you have the ability 
to do f four FMAs uh, at the same time with a single instruction, right? You, you issue the instruction, but it uh, you know, uh, certainly takes multiple operands into consideration in order to do more work. It's the same trick as with FMA, which is also two in one, like two operations in one instruction. Here it's just going a, a step further. And the idea here is to, ha to stay with two, a two-wide machine, right? You know classic Xeon has four instruction throughput uh, per cycle, but Knights is limited to two instructions throughput per cycle. And here you just increase the amount of work or throughput in a, in a sense by just adding these kind of special instructions. Same for variable precision instructions. You have these VNNI instructions that you can utilize for kind of integer kind of uh, and, and uh, loop uh, carry, carry uh, it's a combined instruction that essentially does um, like half precision and but it has some carry over into, into an accumulator. So you can do variable precision and this one also extends to, to four instructions per cycle if you, if you like so. And this way you increase the throughput possible uh, while staying with a slight modification of Knight's Landing. Um, what I didn't include here is the absolute uh, theoretical peak performance for any of these cases, but what I wanted to pick you up is you rely either on enabling this uh, as a domain-specific instru instruction set extension as an in with an in at an intrinsic level, or you just call into libraries. This is exactly the next topic here. You can see there is a big existing, not legacy, but a building up uh, framework or set of frameworks on the machine learning side. You can read uh, about open source frameworks here um, Intel Deep Learning SDK done something more for say automotive and client side. And uh, you, you can also see that scripting languages which are just uh, co-travelers of machine learning to some extent get also some coverage on the Intel side. They just distribute Python packages which eventually call into existing um, uh, libraries like MKL to accelerate certain certain uh, uh, scripted uh, instructions or scripts, and uh, on the left hand side uh, are these things I wanted to to cover a little bit more on one of the next slides. We look at MKL DNN, um, MKL Classic. I, I would say is just covered by an overview what's in the package, but we will look a little bit closer at MKL DNN. Uh, interesting enough. The DNN part um, is open source. You can find it on GitHub. And the DAL, which is a more higher level framework for data analytics, it actually started, I would say, let me put it this way, before the machine learning hype. It, it, it started with the data analytics hype and big data. At that time, it emerged to some extent, but meanwhile also covers machine learning things. So it's a Python-based framework, uh, Java-based. You can read through what it actually supports in terms of the scripting. And it, in the beginning, it exposed existing primitives that we had in MKL for, very, for a very long time, but nobody looked at it. Now with big data label on it or a machine learning label, they are become more, in, more interesting. That, that is basically one of the uh, starting points with these frameworks. And this is still true as we, as we emerge with these frameworks. Data analytics library is just you know, four slides on give, getting you an idea of what that is. Idea is to have some abstraction for data sources like commas, very plain things like comma separated values that could make us happy, but per, uh, or certainly some SQL driver based access to something on the Windows side, I don't know. And there are certainly at least there is some layer to deal with different data sources to get the big data into the analytics. That is the, the point here. And then you have a, a chain of transformations that you can apply to data. And in the beginning, there was a, a big focus on streaming data, some, something that is not there as a whole, but that might um, stream through a chain of uh, statistic analysis, basically. So you could have running average, very simplistic. Of course, you wouldn't call a library. You probably would uh, calculate a running average yourself. But there are other more complicated, uh, complicated statistic properties that you may want to extract struck out of a um, running, diminishing streams of in incoming data, sensor data, 
uh, tables and things like this that you want to analyze for cortosis, geomine, uh, whatever kind of fitting you want to do. And uh, you can see this is supported with scripting languages. You can essentially use in the very end neural networks and you can do collaborate filtering k-means. You can prune away to the, to the top uh, guys in the stream and things like this. But also very solid known and uh, well-known uh, analysis type, pr uh, principal component analysis, statistical moments that I just mentioned earlier and other things. The main features of that are, this is a library built end-to-end -end for applications. It supports typical variety of input processes. As I said earlier, you can deal with various data connectors. And that slide actually helps me to remind what it is. It was HDF5, uh, I guess, or HDFS, uh, comma-separated values. This is my favorite, but maybe you find something else in it. And uh, the focus is on, on batch, online, and stream processing and you have some way to scale up or scale out. And let me just complete these slides. I don't like uh, animated slides too much. You can see within the CPU core, you have SIMD uh, parallel, uh, vectorization and internally this uh, framework relies on the sequential MKL. And on top of it, you have some uh, TBB threading. So it is perhaps composable. That is also a request if you deal with a uh, scripting language on top of it, um, the, the classic OpenMP wouldn't be uh, the best idea here. But happily enough, you probably haven't heard about, there is a flavor of MKL library that has a different threading runtime. You, it is an installation option for the Intel tools. You can have normal MKL, which is OpenMP based as it was always, but you can also have an uh, MKL which is TBB based. And it's basically uh, the instance or the flavor that's used here. So they took really the effort to swap out the, um, say, parallelization framework and use TBB because to have this composability and to deal with tasks rather than threads, right? Anyhow, you can scale into the cluster, but I think there is not much because it essentially tells you you have to do that on your own, right? This is basically the summary of these slides. You have to use MPI or whatever it is on top of it. So maybe that goes something that goes uh, on in the future with Intel DAO. I don't want to tra attract you into more details on that, but it is just the usual uh, on the machine learning side on neural network support. You have just the usual. Um, handles and names and AP elements that you find everywhere in, in, in these emerging uh, neural network APIs. You have some abstraction for tensors, for layers, for topology. You can build a topology at runtime. Uh, you have uh, something that comes, it's pushed forward from the MKL implementation. You have optimization solvers, which is uh, not present in every uh, M, uh, deep learning framework, but certainly of interest, I think. Anyhow, uh, one, since optimization solvers is not so uh, covered, not so well covered in, in typical uh, deep learning frameworks or not really related all the time, I just wanted to list them separately. You have some mean square error analysis, you have cross entropy analysis, and you have real optimization solvers like stochastic uh, gradient descant, you have mini batch SGD and others uh, that might be of interest. In fact, the last one, the BFGS, I think this is uh, also if you, hyper, if you have hyperparameter spaces that you want to tune towards something, I think this is some way to go if you need this uh, programmatically as part of your application. MKL library, I said, there is only one overview slide that gives you uh, an idea of the classic domains that you always had, like linear algebra is, a, of course, not outgrown, but a rather large thing. And Many people think that's it with MKL, but of course you have fast Fourier transform, even with compatible interfaces like FFTW. You have a vector math domain. We talked about short vector math library. This is the, the big, you just leave out the S, the short, and make it also parallel. So this is similar, and they give you three flavors like high accuracy, low, or whatever the names were. And you have also something on the side like vector random number generators that are able to deal with threaded execution, right? It is one 
uh, <laughs> problem or not a trivial thing to to have a consistent number or a random number generator that works in a multi-threaded environment without screwing up or synchronizing on on global properties and there are new some some new primitives uh, for the neural networks which are convolutions uh, pooling normalization and others and with that I think uh, I wanted to show you some of these primitives uh, but I believe this is very very much the same between other frameworks as well. So I think it is, there, there are rather small APIs that deal with activation, normalization, pooling, and things like this. You can, this is more on the low level side, right? Uh, because the topologies, the frameworks, they provide you with a wrap up. They hopefully use something that renders supplied in order to get performance out of the hardware. And it perhaps settles on something that is, say, uh, domain specific hardware or particularly optimized towards. Okay, so the neural network primitives in MKL are, as I said, OpenMP threaded. I, I don't think the slide is really complete because I believe it is TBB threaded as well when you pull in the TBB layer, which is an optional installation. Um, I didn't make a big deal out of it, but Within the MKL package and the MKL DNN, they still expose different APIs at the moment, but they will converge towards second half of this year so that we can just shortcut this thing. If we think about MKL DNN as it is on GitHub as the one that appears with the product later on, the product may keep some legacy, right, and keep the APIs that they exposed already because it's commercial and whatnot. But uh, on the GitHub side, you can already see where it will evolve to and also look into the implementation of it. And I think there is some um, summary on what the difference is, but this is not really interesting as these uh, differences will vanish, I think. And uh, yeah, so with this, I think, um, are any questions on, on this MKL topic? Uh, maybe you'll talk about this later, but just the relationship of MKL to libxsm, I guess. Um, at what point, uh, what is the relationship between these two libraries? Yeah, let's uh, postpone this to later. Sure. It's fair enough, I think. You can just jump into the break. Um, perhaps one question to make this more interactive, because it's always like, oh, one more question. So do, who of you actually looked into uh, machine learning frameworks and when then which one is it on the low level or on the scripting high level side the scientific side that makes you productive or did you actually look at things like qdnn or uh, some of the open source uh, representations like an npeg or mini uh, you know the names uh, so there was one okay so a low level or high level both, both okay good see you high level okay both, okay, again, ah, that's cool, this is both. So I think summary, at least five out of 20 people, just so 25% if we want to make it up, very good. So, so there might be some interest for the second part today, we can, we can look at this. Okay, thanks. <laughs>